Curtis Calhoun here with MMA News, and you know my next guest. He's getting ready to return. Bellator 294. It's Danny Sabatella back on the program. How's it going, Danny? It's going good, man. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks again for the time, man. Uh, first things first, uh, just kind of get me up to speed as to uh, you know what these past few months have been like for you and uh, how pumped are you to get back in there at uh, Bellator 294. Yeah, so immediately after I beat Rafian Stotts in Connecticut, I went right back to the gym because I had no damage. I didn't have any injuries or anything on my body, um, and, I, and I just love this sport. I love getting better at this sport. I love going to the best gym in the world at American Top Team, um, and i just been training my ass off. You know, I'm always evolving as a mixed martial artist. I'm always getting better. I'm always wanting to get better. You know, one thing about this sport is I fucking love it. You know, I don't really look at it as a job or anything like that. I don't really dread practices too much. You know, this shit at the end of the day is fun to me and I love doing it. Um, so I've just been training my ass off. You know, obviously a couple of judges in Connecticut didn't see it going my way. So I've been having a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. I've been a little bit pissed off about that decision to have Stotts beat me, even though I did win that fight. Um, but, you know, I've just been training hard. And then I got the call from Bellator a couple of months ago that I'm going to fight this pussy named Marcos Breno in Hawaii, April 21st. So I've very much been looking forward to that. Uh, it's kind of almost a revenge fight. You know, this entire fight, I'm going to be picturing Rafael Stas's fucking face. That's what I'm going to be picturing when I'm elbowing this Marcos Breno guy. Um, So life has pretty much been good. You know, it's I've been taking it one day at a time, one step forward. Um, I don't like to dwell too much on shit. I'm a very positive guy. You know, obviously, it's a very negative result that it was in Connecticut, and it didn't go my way, and I'm still a little bit salty and upset about it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's not the worst thing that'll ever happen. You know, I will fight Rafian Stotts again. My story doesn't end until I beat the fuck out of that motherfucker. But first things first, Marcos Brenner, April 21st in Hawaii. This is, I feel like, the fourth or fifth time I think that we've talked. And one thing that's always really stood out about you is that win, lose, or draw, you're a grinder, right? You you love training, the whole process of fighting and getting in the gym. But I feel like, you know, after how that last fight played out, I feel like you got some extra fire and, and you're excited for this opportunity. Do you feel like that in terms of you have that extra motivation in the gym now after how that last fight played out? I would say so, you know, uh, for starters, you know, since the day I was born, I've just really been hungry and passionate. So that passion and that hunger and that love for fighting and beating the shit out of another man will always be there. But I feel like I really was robbed in Connecticut and I had something taken from me. Um, and obviously that's not going to sit well for anybody. You know, that's something that I took personal. So it kind of just seems like it was my duty to just get so much better and never leave it in the hand of the judges again. So in order to do that, what do I have to do? I have to get so much better. I need to be a better listener. I need to be smarter in my career. I need to go harder in my career. So that's just really what I've done. You know, we've kind of feel like we've awoken a beast in me, Um, you know, and in this fight, April 21st, this, this is going to be, you know, a very fun fight for me. You know, it's a perfect matchup for me. It's it's a matchup where I should go out there and dominate and impose my will on this guy and split him open and just have fun with it. Um, You know what? I've had a lot of built up aggression and I haven't really beaten the shit out of anybody since I beat the shit out of Stotts. So I'm just kind of just hungry to get back in there, kind of get, you know, everything off my chest and just let loose and just have really just have us be two caged animals in there. You know, we're surrounded by a cage and we get to do whatever the fuck we want to each other. And I think I'm going to take out all my aggression on this motherfucker. You know, obviously, I'm always going to be very aggressive, and I'm always going to try to beat the absolute fuck out of my opponent. But this one just seems a little bit different just because I'm so pissed off. And, and I'm usually very good when I'm pissed off. You know, even going back to my wrestling days, if I was pissed off or I had a little bit more of an edge to me, I'm just better that way. If I just am aggressive this entire time, I, it's going to be a very, very fun fight for me. Especially over the past few years, I feel like there's been, you know, it, it's – it, there's been a lot of questionable scorecards, no matter how you see a fight playing out. I mean, scorecards have kind of been all over the place for the past few years. As a fighter, does that kind of give you more of a sense of urgency to to look for that finish and not leave it in the hands of the judges? Yep, absolutely. You know, you never really know what these judges are thinking. And it's an imperfect sport. It'll always be an imperfect sport. There's not really too much you can do to fix it. Um, but the sport revolves around three people that are judging the fight. It doesn't matter what the entire world, what all the experts might think or and who's winning and how they judge it. It's all up to these three people. So with that in mind, the best thing that you can do is finish a fight. But, you know, obviously that's easier said than done. You know, you're crazy if you don't think all these fighters aren't going out there to try to finish these fights. But you really have to do that. You know, I go back and I watch that fight with Stotts about seven or eight times and, 
I vividly remember in these moments thinking that, why would I take these risks? Why would I open up if I'm winning these rounds and I'm just absolutely dominating this guy? You know, I had about 13 minutes of control time against him, which is about half the fight. He didn't land any strikes on me. He might have landed eight strikes on me and he went for one submission. So I felt that I was winning that fight. And and why would I take the uh, risks? If he's not going to take the risks, I would just easily win this fight. You know, obviously I could have done things in that fight. I could have created more damage. I could have went for more submissions. That's what I should have done. Uh, but, you know, one thing for fighters is you can't be tricked into thinking you're winning the fight and not go for things. And, and that's what I did do. You know, I thought I had the fight sealed and wrapped up. And I remember in those later rounds, I was kind of waiting for a big push from Rafian to try to either finish the fight or try to win the last two rounds and try to steal the fight. Uh, but he didn't really do that. So I didn't really go for too much. I didn't take the risks. And I thought it was an easy victory. Uh, but joke's on me because, you know, I didn't get my hand raised. So with that, it's a learning experience. You know, you always have to constantly be going to finish. You know, you have to take risks. With this fight coming up April 21st in Hawaii, even if I think I have, you know, three rounds in the book and it's the last minute of the third round, I need to be going for a finish. I need to try to finish this fight, whether it's a TKO, a, a knockout, or a submission. I need to do that just because you never know. Um, and it's obviously you're always evolving in a fighter. It's always everything is a learning experience. And it is a pretty big learning experience for me, my last fight, and it was a big one that I needed to learn. When you look at Marcus Breno, obviously uh, you're confident heading into the matchup, but how do you see this fight playing out stylistically? Like, what do you know about him? What have you seen on tape if if you've watched tape on him at all? Yeah, I know he's a little midget. Um, I know he's about 5'6 or so. You know, he's got some okay wins. His last fight was his Bellator debut, and he fought Josh Hill. But that's kind of a hard fight to gauge how good he is because Josh Hill fucking sucks too. So it was pretty much just two midgets going at it. They're both about five six. Uh, I think um, Breno was kind of piecing him up. He seems a little bit powerful. He's very balanced with his strikes. Uh, he seems a little bit more of a counter striker, but he does like to push the pressure and go forward. Um, it's it's kind of hard to, again, gauge how good he is and what he'll do against me because I'm 5'10". I'm a little bit taller and bigger for the weight class. It's going to be a little bit harder for him to come into range and land those heavy, powerful shots uh, just because he's going to have to get past my push kicks, my jabs, and, and my movement. Um, one thing I do is I move really good, and I'm very smart in there. So it's going to be a little bit of a different fight for him, um, a fight that he probably has never felt because he's never fought somebody this tall and had this reach. Um, obviously, you got to respect everybody in this game because anybody can knock out anybody at any time. He, of course, can land a lucky punch. And if he does land a lucky punch, he is powerful. He could put my lights out. But other than that, there's just no way he wins this fight, whether it's on the feet or on the ground, you know, obviously on the ground, I'm the best guy in MMA. So there's no way he could hold a candle to me or anything like that. And and on the feet, I think I'm just going to be too quick, too um, fast, you know, use my range and my reach. And um, if it does go on the feet, I think I could piece him up and knock him out eventually. Um, if his takedown defense is terrible, I take it to the ground and I get a TKO or submission with this fight. This is more so just go out there and have fun. You know, obviously you have a game plan and I, I'm not going to give away any game plan or anything of that such, but anywhere this fight goes, as long as I fight smart and don't get too chaotic, I should kick the fuck out of this guy. Obviously, as always, there's a lot going on in the bantamweight division right now. Uh, you got uh, Rufion Stotts taking on Patchy Mix here pretty soon. You got Patricio Pitbull, Sergio Pettis uh, later this year as well. Where do you feel like a win over uh, Marcus Breno puts you in terms of the title picture in the division? Do you see yourself, you know, putting on a dominant performance and getting right back into that mix? Where do you kind of see uh, this year playing out? Yep, absolutely. There's about four or five of us that are kind of in title contention or have the belt. Um, with the addition of Patricio Pitbull in this division, that's awesome. It just makes this division even more exciting. Um, I've been saying it for a while. Bellator Bantamweight division is the best division in MMA. And obviously with Patricio, who a lot of people think is one of the MMA goats, that just makes it even deeper. That just makes it even more exciting. That just makes these matchups even bigger. Um, you know, Patricio has Pettis and Pettis fucking sucks. So I think Patricio beats him pretty good, whether he has a good performance or bad performance, whether it's a good weight cut or a bad weight cut. He can afford to have either of those because it doesn't fucking matter. Pettis is a little bitch. Um, and then you got Stotts versus Patchy, and then the winner will probably have Patricio. But after that, I see myself getting the title shot. You know, obviously I'm, I'm very high up in this game. Um, and, you know, it'd be one thing if I lost that 
Stott's fight, you know, and got dominated and didn't look good and couldn't hang with the big dogs or whatever. But, you know, most people had me winning that fight. So I think I'm right up there. I think it's just going to have the tournament play itself out and Patricio versus Pettis play itself out. And then I think I'll be right up there. You know, I think after I beat the shit out of Breno and dominate him, I could potentially get a title shot. Or if not, that's fine. Okay, I get one more fight. Um, and, and win that fight. And then I'm going to get that title shot, but I'm definitely right there. Um, as I should be, you know, obviously I'm a big name, but you know, I'm not just getting things handed to me. I am going through the gauntlet. You know, one thing people forget is I had that play in fight in that, um, grand prix tournament where I beat the shit out of Lugo. You know, I, I paved my way, you know, just because I'm a bigger name and, and I'm a fan friendly guy. That doesn't mean that I've just been handed things. You know, I've been, I've fought hard guys, you know, I fought Higo. um, so, yeah, I do think that I will have the belt by the end of this year or beginning of next year, whether it's against Rafion Stotts or Patricio Pitbull. It doesn't matter. Those are two of the guys that I hope have the belt that I can fucking steal it from. You know, I think a, a fight with Patricio Pitbull is just a mega fight, probably one of the biggest fights in Bellator history. Um, So I hope either he has the belt or Rafion has the belt because I fucking hate Rafion. I would love to fucking put my elbow through his skull. Obviously, with the bad blood there with Rufion, uh, how do you see that fight playing out between Rufion, Stotts, and Patchy Mix? Like, I get your prediction and get your thoughts on how that could potentially play out. Yeah, they're both not very good. They're both very sloppy. Um, I would say they're both ground guys. Um, I think Patchy could potentially catch Stotts in the first couple rounds, you know, when they're dry in the Vaseline and the blood and the sweat isn't dripping where shit is more slippery. Um, but if it does go past the first couple rounds, I think – Stotts probably has more of an advantage, but I, I really don't give a fuck who wins this fight. I don't care about either of those guys. To me, I'm better than both those guys. I beat the fuck out of both those guys. To tell you the truth, I forgot they were even fucking fighting because they're so goddamn boring. Nobody gives a fuck about either of those guys, so I, I really don't give a shit. I got you, man. And I got to ask you, like, I feel like I I've said it for a while now that I feel that you are the best self-promoter in Bellator right now. I don't even think it's a close second. So I got to ask you, like, as, as a fighter and, and looking at some other fighters in Bellator and just across the sport in general, what do you feel like is missing from some other Bellator fighters in terms of marketing themselves, self-promotion? Like, how important is that as a fighter to be able to sell yourself? Yeah, it's very big. First off, thank you. But also, I mean, people are just afraid of the backlash. You know, I think people don't want to put pressure on themselves because they're a bunch of pussies. You know, one thing in this game, a lot of people think these fighters are these big macho tough guys. Half these guys are fucking pussies out there and they're afraid of the repercussions. They're afraid of saying what they think and then maybe losing a fight and then getting the backlash online and in this Twitter and Instagram world and people talking shit about them. You know, one thing about me is I just don't give one fuck about what people say. You know, if I go out there and something, how something happens and this Marcos Breno guy fucking knocks me out, that's okay. You know, I don't really give a fuck what these nerds on Instagram say. Don't really give a shit. I think these people are just afraid of the backlash if they do lose and they're afraid to really be themselves. You know, a lot of people shell up in the spotlight, you know, when the attention and the adrenaline's going and, and everything is, is on, on you, Either all eyeballs are on you. I think people shell up, but you know, I think people need to just fucking be free, be themselves. You know, a lot of these guys are fucking boring, so you shouldn't be somebody you're not. But if, you know, you're going to be you, just take it to the fucking max and just don't be afraid of fucking anything. You know, I, obviously, I am one of the best fucking guys in this game at selling a fight and all that. But it's just good for me because I'm being me, you know, I, I and I don't give a fuck. You know, one thing that is good for these guys that talk shit and sell fights is them not giving a fuck. And so many people are such pussies out there. They care about what people think. And I couldn't give one fuck. A few more questions for me, man. Once again, I really do appreciate the time. It's always great catching up with you. Uh, Jorge Masvidal, obviously a huge presence down there at American top team. Uh, he's been the, one of the faces of that gym for a long time. I got to get your thoughts on his retirement and uh, what is uh, something you've learned from watching his career and how he's carried himself? Yeah, Jorge Masvidal is just one of the MMA goats. You know, he's an icon of the sport. He is the team captain at American Top Team. You know, he's somebody that when he's fighting, the buzz around the gym is insane. Everybody wants to see him succeed. He's very good for the gym. If you know him, he's a very fucking nice guy. Um, we clicked right away when I went down to American Top Team. Um, he, You know, that's that's a guy that if somebody in the gym is fighting, I will 100% have their back no matter what. 
Um, I, I very much so have so much high praise for Jorge Masvidal. Um, right when I got to the gym, he was having massive fights, and I didn't really have my fight career starting off yet. I didn't even have a fight, and he would stay after practice and working with me and, and giving me advice and everything. And that's something that I will cherish forever. That's something that I'll never forget. I w- I'll give back eventually with, with guys that are just starting out their fight careers, as he did with mine. You know, and that's just something that's going on at American Top Team that's fucking awesome is is the care for one another and the loyalty to one another. Um, you know, you have a guy that is as big as Jorge Masvidal. Is, he's the, one of the biggest names in the entire sport, and he's spending one-on-one time after practices with me for no reason other than just trying to get me better. Um, those are just memories that will last a lifetime, and those are crazy memories that I've had of him, and there's so many other ones that – that he's just the fucking man, you know. If you know Jorge or you've seen him, he, he's he's just an absolute legend and he's an icon of the sport. I'm very happy that he was as successful and he's, he was in this sport. You know, he really is the BMF. He is the bad motherfucker. A lot of these fighters go out there and they might have a good year, a good two years, a good three years. That's a guy that was in the game fighting top, top level for 20 fucking years and very successful at it. So obviously... His skills for, speak for themselves, and his personality is even better. Last question for me, man. When you uh, you know envision how the fight plays out, what are the headlines going to read after Bellator 294? What are uh, us in the media going to be talking about after your fight? Yeah, you'll be saying Sabatello is back to being an absolute animal. You know, with this fight, I'm so much better than these guy, this guy in every fucking area. And I'm going to go out there and I just absolutely let loose. You know, obviously we've seen how I am when I'm very aggressive and I just get to my style and get on my positions. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to be like a dog on a bone in this fight and I'm just going to get to where I want and then just absolutely beat the fucking shit out of this guy. You know, I got a lot of built up anger. I got a lot of aggression towards this guy and I want to see very violent things. And that's exactly what is going to happen. You know, I'm levels above this guy. So it is going to get very ugly and it's going to be very exciting for the fucking fans. April 21st, love him or hate him, fans, uh, you know, he's going to come ready to fight. Danny Sabatello, it's always great to chat with you and uh, pick your brain on what's going on with the sport. Uh, All the best in these final few days of camp, and uh, I'm sure we'll chat again soon, man. Thank you so much for the time. I appreciate it. Yep, absolutely. Thanks for having me.